I've been studying logic in math class, and more specifically, I've been studying the negation of conditional statements. Anyone who knows me knows that I have a passion for sharing who God is and what God does. Part of being God's minister or ambassador of reconciliation is um, clarifying some things that people have been told about God that are not true. The negation of a conditional statement. Suppose that someone makes the conditional statement, if it rains, then I take my umbrella. When will the person have lied to you? The only case in which you would have been misled is when it rains and the person does not take the umbrella. Letting P represent it rains and Q represent I take my umbrella. You might suspect that the statement, the true statement, if it rains, then I take my umbrella, looks like this. The false statement looks like this. Notice that the arrow has been removed and replaced with this sign, which means and. The reason that this has happened is because P no longer implies Q. We have P and we have Q, two separate ideas. Then the second idea, Q, we change it from what it is, a true statement, into a false statement by putting this little twisty sign in front of it. The only way that you can negate a conditional statement is by leaving the first part true and then making the second part false. And so for the conditional statement, if it rains, then I take my umbrella. Now that we have doctored it, it says, it rains, I do not take my umbrella. The same pattern in scripture. You have what scripture says, which is true, and then you have the interpretation of it, which is a lie. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 22. For even as in Adam all die, so also, in the Christ, all shall be made alive. As it is, with an unbiased viewpoint, we would think that the first part implies the second part. If we do to this statement what we did to the conditional statement about the rain and the umbrella, then it would say, This is not a translation problem. This is a preconceived bias. There's a few different ways that the traditional thinking believer will tell you that um, this doesn't really mean what it appears to mean. The first way would be that they would agree with you and say, Oh yes, P does imply Q. So there is a resurrection, but it's just so that God can judge and then it's over with. Whatever their eternal destiny is, that's what happens. Now there are a few things in the context that support this view. Paul here is refuting the idea that there is no such thing as resurrection. They read this and they say, well, it clearly shows that this is the order of how it goes. Christ rose up and then after him, the ones that belong to him, and then the end. It's kind of odd to me, you know, that he would word it like this because he says afterwards, those who are the Christ in his presence, then the end, and he kind of leaves out 
But what about the ones who are not the Christ? If you read the entire chapter of 1 Corinthians 15 from beginning to end, there's this flow of ideas with a common theme. That common theme being the resurrection. And he explains to us what this resurrection is. Verse 35, it says, But someone will say, How do the dead rise? When Paul describes this resurrection, he goes into great detail about it, and it sure sounds good to me. What happens between the time a person dies? Um, I'm still figuring that out. I know that um, there will be a lot of people who are expecting one thing and will get another, and maybe that's a good thing or maybe that's a bad thing. I'll leave that between you and God. Traditional-minded people don't have a problem with P. What they have a problem with is Q. P doesn't make or break their traditional beliefs. Q that does. That destroys the idea of eternal torment or annihilation. Death, where is your sting? You know, he's, he's gloating over death. Um, obviously, this resurrection can't result in a majority of these resurrected being sent into a condition of eternal death. It just doesn't follow. If God is all in you, then there's not a part of you that is against God. And if He's all in all, then it means that there exists no one who is not fully subjected to God. 